All right, here we are again. So tonight, uh, last week we did the first chapter. And so this week we'll pick it up where we left off. There's um, two, two more chapters posted on Blackboard. So we'll probably get through all of chapter two and then probably a large percentage of three. So um, why don't we do that? Now, of course, since we just started, We'll have no talk about exams or assignments. We'll just have a relaxing evening with our material, which a lot of it revolves around interest rates, which is a very interesting topic. And of course, it's always relevant because virtually every security in the marketplace, um, the price is affected by interest rates. So that's really one of the more important uh, areas of our study, which the, um, not only how interest rates work, but how they determine the prices of security in the marketplaces, um, and then how the uh, rates themselves are determined um, by the Federal Reserve System and other factors. So, all right, anyway, let's see, here we go. Number two. All right, so, oh, let me get this out of here. Um, all right, so in chapter two, you can see we're going to be looking at the determination of interest rates. In other words, where do they come from? That's an interesting question. And if we understand where they come from, we can understand how they change over time and how, of course, they ultimately impact on our own investments. That's really what we're interested in here. How does this affect us? Um, it's important to understand this. But um, let's face it, you know, the primary reason why we're interested in this topic is to understand how it affects our own investments and um, you know, how that affects our ability to save for our retirement and that type of thing. Anyway, so we're going to do this in terms of what we will call the loanable funds framework, which is itself really a simple extension of traditional supply and demand analysis. So just in case you've started to forget, let me just quickly remind you how this works. So if you're looking at the market for single good, uh, whatever it happens to be, it doesn't really matter. Oh, hold on, what happened here? Uh, the traditional framework would have us draw a set of axes where the price is on the vertical axis the quantity is on the horizontal axis. We have a downward sloping demand curve and an upward sloping supply curve. And where the two curves cross, we have equilibrium. We'll call that E here. And this is the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. And this is the unique point where the quantity demanded exactly equals the quantity supplied. So the markets are in balance here and we refer to that as E or equilibrium. Once we reach this point, there's no tendency for the price of the quantity to change. If the price is, let's say, up here somewhere where it's a little higher than the equilibrium price, that indicates that the quantity supplied exceeds the quantity demanded and we have what's called a surplus. And when that happens, the price will drop. The producers will recognize that they're charging too much for this product. People aren't buying what they're making or at least not all of it. The price will gradually fall and eventually we'll find ourselves back in equilibrium. If on the other hand, we set the price too low, let's say Q, uh, P3, we have the opposite situation. The quantity demanded now is greater than the quantity supplied because the price is so low. And this situation is referred to as a shortage. You know, and you've experienced this, you go to the store and something's on sale and you know it's been on sale because 
it's missing from the shelves. Okay, one day you go to the store and you're hoping to buy some haagen ice cream and you get there and it's all gone. Why? Because the store put it on sale. And so the shelves are empty. The price is too low. When the price goes back to normal, the shelves will be full again. Okay. So equilibrium is where the economy tends to gravitate towards. If we're not in equilibrium, um, the prices will adjust until we find ourselves back in equilibrium. And this it, this can happen very quickly. It's it, in some markets, it might take a little longer, but this should happen more or less automatically. Now, if there's a change in either supply or demand, that will have an impact on the equilibrium price and quantity. So for example, if we start in equilibrium, let's call this one. This is the first equilibrium position. If the demand for this product increases for some reason, where the new de demand curve intersects the original supply curve, you can see that prices have gone up. The equilibrium price is now up here instead of down here. So we call this an increase in demand. And it simply means that if people want more of their product, they can certainly have it, but they have to expect to pay a higher price. And down here, we'll show the opposite case. The one on the top, it could, this, by the way, this could happen for many reasons. Our incomes could go up. Our taste for this product could go up. For example, what if this product that we're looking at is avocados? Well, over the last 20 or 30 years, people have come to love avocados. Okay, 30 years ago, nobody ever heard of them. Now they're all over the place because Mexican food is so popular. So over time, the taste has changed. And before you know it, everybody wants avocados and we can have them, but the price will be a little bit higher. Now, we have the opposite scenario occurring down here. We started at this high price and all of a sudden people get tired of something. Let's say that for some reason, people are starting to cut back on their consumption of beef. They start switching to chicken and pork and you know fish and all the rest. And so they start buying less beef. The demand curve shifts to the left. And this is known as, by the way, a decrease in demand. And of course, it stands to reason that everything works in reverse. The price has to drop, but so does the quantity. So in other words, if we don't want as much beef, that's fine. Um, one of the advantages of this is that it will become cheaper to the, to the people who still want it. Okay, now of course we have to consider what happens to the supply when there's a change. What happens to the market for a good when there's a change in supply? All right, so we'll start out with the same setup. We started our equilibrium position here. And this time, let's let the supply go up. This, for example, could be the result of improved technology. And here we have a very happy scenario. Uh, oops, I drew something wrong here. This should be two. This is an increase in supply and it could be due to a lot of reasons, but if it's technology or some other uh, factor that reduces the cost of production, you can see that we can have more of this product and at a lower price, which is really nice. And then finally, we can have the opposite scenario. There's been a decrease in supply here. Uh, 
the equilibrium position rises from one to two. And sadly enough, we have a higher price and a lower quantity. This is the exact opposite of what we want. This is a decrease in supply. That could be caused by a lot of things. Like for example, there could be an increase in the cost of oil. A lot of products are made with oil. So that drives up the price of other goods. And it also means people buy less of those products. So in, um, in finance, we can often take the supply and demand framework and apply it to financial um, securities and also financial variables like interest rates. Here we're looking at the prices of actual goods and services, but this same framework can be applied in a lot of areas. So with loanable funds, which means exactly what it sounds like, funds that are available to be lent to customers, there's a supply and there's a demand. And we have to understand what influences the supply and demand and how they they're jointly interact to determine the equilibrium rate of interest in the economy. All right, so with all that being said, loanable funds are available to be bar, uh, lent from uh, savers to borrowers. That's how it works. If nobody ever saved a penny, uh, there would be no borrowing either because there's nothing to lend. Okay, in order for there to be borrowers, there have to be savers. Now you're probably aware that when you go to your bank, any money you may have deposited in that bank has probably been lent out to somebody else. Um, it, it's not sitting there in the vault, that's for sure. Now, if you ask for your money back, they'll, they'll find it for you. Um, they'll have money in the vault, in the drawers, whatever. But if everybody came back and asked for their money at the same time, that would be a problem because the money just isn't there. It's been lent out to other customers. So uh, loanable funds ultimately come from individuals who save their money and they turn around and they lend it out to, or if they don't, the banks do, they lend it out to borrowers, which most sectors of the economy are actually borrowers, as we'll see in a few minutes. Okay, so again, as I mentioned just now, the loanable funds theory of interest rate determination explains in interest rates in terms of the interaction between the supply and demand for loanable funds. And both of them will react not so much to prices, but to interest rates. All right, that's one way in which this is different than what we just did before. There on the vertical axis, we had prices. Now we have interest rates. All right, so why don't we start with the demand for loanable funds? Who is it that demands loanable funds? That's the same thing as saying, who borrows money in the economy? Well, most of the economy actually does ultimately borrow. Now, households will borrow often to buy expensive goods like houses and cars and to finance and education and all kinds of large investments. But on balance, households save more than they borrow. Okay, we say that households are net savers. Okay, net savers. In other words, they lend, or say, I guess what I should say is they, lending and saving are the same thing. They save on, on, on a, as a whole, for the economy as a whole, not necessarily each individual household. They save more than they borrow. Businesses for the most part are borrowers. Businesses are constantly needing more funds to run their businesses. And where do they get it from? They can borrow from banks. But they can also issue bonds to investors.
And a bond, as we'll see more in more detail later on, is a security which is used to raise money by promising interest payments to the lender. Now governments, theoretically a government could actually be a saver if it ran up a budget surplus, but the, the chances of that happening are pretty much zero. So governments borrow from the public by issuing bonds. Now, of course they take in a lot of tax revenues, but that's rarely enough to cover all their spending. Um, whoops, issuing bonds. And then foreign businesses and governments also borrow in the United States for the same reasons but they borrow here in the US if it is cheaper than borrowing in their own countries. That's the whole point of being here. Okay, so it looks to me like there's a lot more borrowing going on here than lending. Well, no, actually, um, there's a, there can only be as much borrowing as there is lending. Um, without savings, we have no borrowing. So clearly, households are saving enough, in spite of everything, to finance all of this borrowing. So these four, these are the four main components of the demand for loanable funds. All right, I'll give you a second to catch up. Now, let's just take another deep, more detailed look at how this is happening. So, let's look at households one more time. They may borrow for to buy expensive items, homes, um, durable goods, such as autos, appliances, furniture. Uh, economists define durable goods as anything that's designed to last three years or more. This is, this is coming to us from the government agencies that gather up this data. I don't know where they came up with three years, but that's what we have here. And then of course, financing and education, really besides buying a home, maybe the most expensive, purchase you'll ever make. But of course, that's an investment. All right, now, now here's the interesting part. As interest rates fall, of course, households are willing to borrow more because borrowing becomes cheaper. So if you had your eye on a new car, the time to buy it is when interest rates are low especially a house, you could save a fortune on a house by borrowing the money for the house, the mortgage that is, when interest rates are low. So consumers are very sensitive to changes in interest rates. They'll tend to borrow more when rates are low because they can, it's cheaper, but also because they want to buy things. In other words, consumers want, constantly want new things and they will, will probably buy more of them when interest rates are cheaper because then it's easier to afford them. But if rates start to rise, of course the opposite happens. Households cut back on their borrowing since borrowing is more expensive. So here's our first curve um, from the book. We're going to have the interest rate on the vertical axis and the quantity of loanable funds on the horizontal axis. So we'll call that Q and I. Now, you probably wonder why is I on the vertical axis? You can think of the interest rate is the price 
of holding loanable funds. Or actually what I should say is borrowing lo loanable funds. So there's, if I want to borrow, I'll pay I percent every year on my loan. It's similar, but not identical, of course, to the per dollar price that I pay to buy a good or a service. And if you notice, of course, the demand curve is downward sloping the way you would expect, because clearly when rates drop, the demand or the quantity demanded of loanable funds increases. So this, the curve is downward sloping. Now, the, the book uses the following notation. This little H stands for households. They're gonna make a distinction between the, the um, demand for loanable funds from these different sectors. So the, the idea here is that they may respond differently to changes in interest rates. So they would like to keep them separate from each other, although they will eventually draw a single demand curve that represents all the different sectors of the economy. But they do want to keep them separate because some of these sectors, um, they will be very much affected by interest rates and others not so much. All right. How about the business demand for loanable funds? Why do businesses borrow? Well, it could be that they want to just expand the size of the company or the business. Uh, they may have some plans for developing new products to enter new markets, maybe to update its capital equipment. Maybe the employees could use some new computers. Um, ultimately, businesses borrow for one reason only, to increase their profits. That's the only reason they exist in the first place is to make profits. So when rates are low, they're going to borrow more. It's just that simple because it's more profitable. When rates are higher, they will cut back on their borrowing because it's too expensive. So if they're developing new products, et cetera, it probably will have to wait till interest rates go down to a lower level because it's costing the company too much. Or if the, the employees need new computers, they may have to wait till interest rates start to fall. So the business demand for loans, loanable funds, is also downward sloping. So the B stands for business. Okay, so the, the slope isn't, it's always going to be negative. What can happen is that for some of these sectors, the demand curve could be steeper than in others, but they'll all have that negative or downward slope. Now the government, this is a different ball game altogether. The government is not trying to buy products for itself. It's not trying to uh, in, earn profits. They don't, it, it's not a profit making organization. Their only motivation in uh, borrowing loanable funds is to cover their deficits. The amount that they have to borrow depends on how much tax revenues fell short of their spending. And so because of that, the amount that they borrow does not depend on interest rates. They have to borrow that money whether they like it or not. All right, so in other words, if rates are 2% or 20%, they have to borrow the amount they need to cover their deficits. And if they don't, they lose all their credibility and then they'll have to pay more interest in the future. So they have to do this. So because of that, the demand curve is actually vertical. Okay, um, a downward sloping demand curve means that, let's remind ourselves, When we have a downward sloping demand curve, 
it's because as rates drop, the quantity demanded increases. That's not happening here. The amount they need is fixed by the budget deficit. So they've got two curves here. If you notice the first one is G1 and the second one is G2. The second one means the deficit increased. But they're both vertical, which means not affected by interest rates. Okay, so that's what we need to know here. And again, this is one of the reasons why all the demand curves are listed separately because they all react differently to changes in interest rates. All right, now, do we miss anyone? Ah, what we did not discuss yet is other governments besides the federal government. There are other governments that have the authority to borrow. These are referred to as municipal governments, city, state, and local governments. Now, the difference here is that they normally only borrow to finance local projects like bridges and roads and schools and, you know, that kind of thing. And those types of projects can be postponed if necessary. All right. The federal government has to borrow in the same year that they've run up deficits to cover their de uh, debts. But here, that's not true. If the government of, let's say, the state of New York wants to build a new bridge, they don't have the money, they, maybe they can wait till next year or the year after. So because of that, they will be sensitive to changes in interest rates. They'll try to borrow and finance projects when rates are at unusually low levels and cut back when rates are at higher levels. Of course, we all know, like in the state of New York, within the last two years, I guess, I don't remember anymore, the new Tappan Zee Bridge. That had to be, well, that was, they couldn't put it off too much longer. It was supposedly falling apart, but they managed to get it done fairly quickly. Um, man, if the COVID had struck while they were building it, that would have been bad, because they would have had to leave it sitting there. Um, but anyway, so this is what's normally financed by city, state, and local governments or municipal governments. So their demand has the normal downward slope because they may be able to defer their borrowing when rates are very high. Or when rates drop, then they can just say, listen, we can borrow more money now and catch up with some projects that we haven't had time to fix yet, uh, finish yet. All right, now we're almost ready for the last one, foreigners. Foreign businesses and foreign governments may borrow in the United States. Now, a lot of the businesses that borrow here are also doing business here. For example, Nissan has factories in the Southern United States. If Nissan needs to borrow money to build more cars in the US, it stands to reason that they would borrow dollars in the United States rather than borrowing yen in Japan because they're going to use those dollars to pay their expenses in the United States. Foreign governments sometimes borrow here because their own capital markets are simply not large enough to, for them to get all the money they need. Uh, Brazil, for example, has an enormous amount of debt. And there may simply not be enough savings in Brazil to cover all those debts. So they come here because the capital markets are clearly a lot larger. Now here, this of impact is the same as with the other cases, except for the federal government. When US rates fall, foreigners are more likely to borrow here. Okay, so in other words, what they're doing is they're looking at our rates compared to their own rates before they decide where to borrow. If our rates are unusually low, foreigners are more likely to jump in and borrow in the United States because they can save on interest payments. 
All right, so now this uh, F means foreign. The foreign demand for loanable funds looks like this. Now, the demand curve shifting to the right means foreigners are likely to borrow more in the US than they did with DF1. And one reason this can happen is if the foreign rate of interest rises, that means borrowing in the US becomes relatively more attractive than it was before. And so the foreign demand for loanable funds in the United States will increase, all right? Now, obviously, this cuts both ways. This curve could represent the foreign rate of interest falls. And now it might be cheaper to borrow in their own countries. So this curve shifts around due to factors including the foreign rate of interest. All right. So if the foreign rate goes up, the foreign demand for loanable funds will increase and vice versa. Now, we're gonna bring all these together into what's called the aggregate demand for loanable funds. In economics, aggregate is simply a fancy word for total. And what we're doing is combining the demands from all of these sectors into one gigantic demand curve for loanable funds for the entire country. All right, now that, it means you're adding them up basically to come up with the total or aggregate demand for loanable funds in the United States. Now here in the book, they have a nice graph where they show the individual demands. And when they combine them, you have to visualize here that imagine I'm adding these together and end up at the bottom with this aggregate demand curve. A means aggregate or total. So that's the entire, all these sectors provide this demand for borrowing loanable funds in the United States. And even though one of these is vertical, the net amount of all of these added up, if you can see, we add these together, we still have on balance, a downward sloping demand curve. Okay. The slope is negative. That's what you would get with any normal demand curve. And then this is no exception. All right, now up to this point, we've been only looking at the demand, the supply of loadable funds ultimately comes from households, although it could come from other sources as well. In order for all this borrowing to take place, somebody's got to have some savings available. So, the supply of loanable funds comes from savings. Households, like I said before, are net savers, even though they both borrow and lend on balance. Households lend more than they borrow. Now, a business can have savings, um, and they frequently do, as a matter of fact. Um, the way this works is at the end of the year, they have, after all their expenses are paid, if there's anything left over, it's called net income. And whatever's left over after they pay dividends, out of that net income, is a type of savings which is known as 
retained earnings. Now, if the company chooses to lend out those retained earnings by putting them in the bank or buying bonds, for example, that becomes part of the supply of loanable funds. On the other hand, if they just sit on it, um, you know, it may not be available to be lent out. So the businesses often do save in the form of retained earnings, but um, it only becomes part of the supply of loanable funds if it's available um, to a bank, let's say, to lend out to customers. Now, governments, um, yeah, governments can be part of the supply Supply loanable funds if they have a budget surplus. Yeah, that's likely to happen. It's not impossible. Um, some foreign governments do, in fact, have surpluses, but not here, that's for sure. And then finally, foreign businesses and governments, um, you'd be surprised. Um, foreign businesses may um, you know, lend some of their funds in the US. Foreign governments will sometimes buy up US Treasury bonds uh, with any surplus funds they may have. So foreign businesses and governments may also be able to, to provide some loanable funds. But ultimately, the main source of these funds is households. Okay. Now, here, periodically, you hear talk in Washington about encouraging more savings with tax breaks and all this and that. Sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't. Americans, in general, do not save a very large percentage of their incomes, certainly less than most, uh, most other countries. In fact, um, if we wanted to confirm this, Let's see if we can come up with a list. Okay, well, you're gonna see the US is in pretty far down the list. All right, so Macau, Ireland, for whatever reason, the Irish are very frugal and they save. Um, and we work our way down a little ways. Where do you think the US is? Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay, one of these days. I don't know. I hope we're on the list. Ooh, I'm starting to get nervous. Wait a minute, did I go right past it? Oh no. There it is. Oh, I went right past it. It's 100. We're the 100th, 16.9%. Well, you know, it's not, it needs to be lower than that. Now, let's compare that with Japan, though. Japan is at 24.5. Germany is at 27.4. And Austria, their cousins next door, practically, are at 28.4%. So yeah, some of these other countries, uh, Switzerland, 34.3, these are really high. Um, but without this, there'd be no lending, a borrowing rather. So, all right, so the US is pretty far down on the list, but still, since it's such a large economy, 16.9% of a large economy is still a lot of money. So households tend to provide most of that savings uh, for the loanable funds market. Sometimes businesses do, very rarely governments, and sometimes foreigners. So now in this case, the higher the rates of interest are, the more likely the uh, households are to save 
and make their funds available in the loanable funds market. Of course, because they're getting a higher rate of return. The whole point of saving is to get the highest possible rate of return. So what that means, oh, and one more thing, this is something else that we have to take into account. The Federal Reserve System, which we'll discuss later on, is the central bank of the United States. They can actually increase the supply of loanable funds when they carry out monetary policy. With expansionary monetary policy, what the Fed is actually doing is they're increasing the money supply and the supply of loanable funds for the express purpose of lowering interest rates and stimulating the economy. That could be a source of loanable funds, although they, they're they not going to overdo it because if they do, we could start to have more inflation. All right, on the other hand, if inflation is out of control, the Fed might start lowering the money supply, which means loanable funds will drop and interest rates will rise. All right, so with all that being said, we're gonna bring all these together like we did before. Aggregate, there's that word again, fancy word for total. And the potential supply of funds, loanable funds is coming from all of these sources, households, businesses, theoretically the federal government, municipal governments, foreigners, and the Fed. Now, here's the supply curve, and you'll probably be able to anticipate that it is in fact upward sloping. Now, if you notice, let me go back and revisit with you the demand curve for loanable funds. Well, it's hard to tell, but the supply curve of loanable funds is quite a bit steeper than the demand curve for loanable funds. Steeper. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Okay, well, let's just take a bit of a side detour here. Um, let's take a look at two demand curves. We'll start there. All right, so suppose that the price of a good is $10. And for this market, uh, or this consumer, this could be two different consumers. Consumer one and consumer two. At a price of $10, consumer one buys five units. At a price of five, they buy six units. Uh, okay, I have to be careful with these drawings. Over here though, at a price of 10, this consumer is buying five units of the good. But when the price drops to five, whoa, they're gonna go all the way up to 20 units of the good. Okay, so consumer one is insensitive to price changes. In other words, their buying patterns are not affected very much by price changes. They're going to buy, I mean, when the price is cut in half, they'll go from five to six units and that's it. Whereas consumer two, 
they're saying, oh my God, the price is cut in half. I'm going to buy four times as many units of this good as I did before. So consumer two is highly sensitive. to price changes. Okay, now in economics, the terminology that we use to describe these two cases is this. So remember, consumer one Consumer one um, is insensitive to price changes. Therefore, is we're going to call this price elasticity of demand is very low. Okay, the price elasticity demand is the sensitivity of a consumer to changes in prices. Consumer two, on the other hand, is highly sensitive to price changes. Therefore, his price elasticity of demand is very high. So what that means then is that different consumers can have different sensitivities to changes in price. In both cases, when the price fell, they both bought more units of the good, but consumer two bought a lot more than consumer one. So the steepness of the curve indicates the sensitivity to changes in prices. So just in general, a steep curve indicates that the demand for that product, I should say a steep demand curve, indicates that the demand for the product is, we're gonna call it inelastic. A flat demand curve indicates that the demand for the product is elastic or sensitive. Okay, let me put that in parentheses here. And here it means sensitive. Okay, so when we tell you uh, in these notes that um, the supply curve is steeper Uh, as it says here, the supply curve is upward sloping. Since more loanable funds are supplied at higher rates of interest, as we know, the supply curve is steeper than the demand curve for loanable funds. So what this means then is that lenders or savers, the behavior of savers, in other words, the suppliers of loanable funds, is far less sensitive to changes in interest rates than the behavior of um, borrowers. In other words, the demanders of loanable funds. Okay, and you can kind of see why. I mean, if you're a household or a consumer, why do you save? Well, um, saving is going to provide you with, you know, safe, a safety net. Uh, consumers will save even when interest rates are relatively low. Um, for safety reasons, among other things so that the supply of loanable funds is relatively insensitive to interest rates. 
but consumers borrow or they borrow far more when rates are low than high so that the demand for loanable funds is highly sensitive to interest rates. So in other words, you know, when you're saving, you're saving because you need to hang on to the money just for emergency reasons and just so you have something available in case there's a problem. You may save a lot of money, even if rates are really, really low. But with borrowing, that's a completely different story. You're not going to want to borrow a lot of money when interest rates are high, unless you, for example, need to move into a house right away or something like that, or you must have a new car um, or newer car because your old one broke down. But for the most part, saving is less sensitive to interest rates than borrowing. And so that's why after all this discussion, we expect to see that this, you see how the supply curve is very steep and the demand curve is it's kind of steep and not quite as steep as the supply curve. And so where they, we bring these together, of course, this is our equilibrium rate of interest I, and down here is our equilibrium quantity of loanable funds. So at any given point in time, the interaction between the two is, is telling us what our supply and demand for loan, uh, sorry, uh, the interest rate and the quantity of loanable funds will be. All right. So, so far so good, I hope. And um, all right, anyway, now, just like with any other market, if the interest rate is not where it belongs in equilibrium, there could be a surplus, for example, if for some reason, okay, let's say using our graph here, And by the way, don't I just mention want to mention one more time this A means aggregate or total. What if the interest rate is not here at the proper equilibrium level? But let's say it's way up here somewhere. Um, here, the quantity supplied, ex just like before, exceeds the quantity demanded. There's more funds available than people want to borrow. So guess what's going to happen? Rates will drop. And eventually, we'll find ourselves back in equilibrium. <coughs> this is a surplus. And of course, down here with the very low rates, for some reason, rates are too low. Um, down here, we'll have a shortage because the quantity demanded exceeds the quantity supplied, and that will drive up interest rates. People go to the banks and say, listen, we want to borrow money, and the banks will say, whoops, we don't have any to lend to you. Okay, so the rate has to go up. That way, people who really need to borrow will pay the higher rate, so the rate will go back to the equilibrium level. So again, in that sense, this supply and demand framework is exactly the same as what we had with a single good or service. All right, now, just like with our supply and demand curves, we'd like to know what factors can cause the supply and demand curves to shift around. So just in general, just wanna mention, that with supply and demand curves, um, a change in price causes a movement along the same curve. A change in any other factor causes the entire curve 
to shift. It could go to the left or to the right, but what we do know is that if something other than the price of the good changes, then the entire curve will shift. And we'll find ourselves with a new equilibrium price and quantity. When it comes time for the loanable funds model, with the supply and demand for loanable funds curves, a change in the rate of interest causes a movement along the same curve, which means that a change in any other factor causes the entire curve to shift. All right, the only difference here is that we're looking at on the vertical axis an interest rate. So therefore, if that changes, we move up and down the same curves. Otherwise, we, the entire curve shifts. And when the curves shift, we should expect to find a new equilibrium interest rate and quantity. All right, I'll just add that as well. If the supply or demand curve shifts, the equilibrium price and quantity will change for the supply and demand curves for loanable funds. Um, if the curves shift, the equilibrium rate of interest and quantity of loanable funds will also change. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out what factors do affect interest rates in through their um, impact on loanable funds. A change in any one of these will cause, lead to a change in the entire curve, which in turn will trigger a change in the equilibrium rate of interest. So let's take a look at some of these. These are all basically macro factors like economic growth, inflation, monetary policy, government deficits, foreign flows of funds into or out of the country. All of these can potentially affect domestic interest rates. The question is how? All right, well, we're gonna go through and use economic logic to figure out how each of these impacts on supply and demand curves for loanable funds and in turn, the equilibrium rate of interest. Now, some of them will make perfectly good sense and some of them might seem a little surprising. All right, so let's find out how these affect interest rates. Now growth, obviously growth is beneficial to everybody. The faster the economy is growing, the more affluent we will be, the higher our standards of living. When the economy is growing, people wanna buy more goods and services. Of course they do, because they're People, people want to have more fun things. That's just reality. I'd like you to show me a person who doesn't want to have more fun items. That person doesn't exist, okay? Um, fun, people live to own fun things. <laughs> All right, well, maybe it's not quite at that simplistic level, but let's not kid ourselves. Nobody would say no to having more uh, toys in their house. Okay, whether those toys take the form of new clothes or um, new iPhones or whatever it is, the more money we have, the happier we're all going to be. That's just reality. So as the economy is growing, we become more affluent. We can afford to have more nice things. We're more likely to borrow money to buy houses and cars and other expensive items that we've always wanted. Vacations, you name it. And suddenly we realize, hey, we can't afford to go to the Bermuda. 
hey, we can't afford a new car. But of course, we still have to borrow that money. I mean, we're, we didn't become that affluent. Um, and besides, even if we did, what starts to happen? What if you do actually have the ability to plunk down enough cash to buy a Volkswagen? What are you likely to do? You're not going to buy the Volkswagen. You're going to use that as a down payment on a, on a Tesla, okay? Because you're saying, I, I can afford a Tesla now. So that's just the way it is, okay? Or if you were originally going to take a, a little trip to New York City, now all of a sudden it has to be at least the Bahamas, all right? So that means more borrowing. So as that happens, the, um, there's more borrowing, there's more demand for borrowing. And not only that, but look at businesses. Suddenly their businesses are more profitable. The economy is booming. So now is a good time to expand their operations or develop new products or whatever it takes to increase their profitability in the future. So guess what? Now they're going to go out and borrow more money to do exactly that. So the demand for loanable funds is going to grow pretty quickly, which means the entire curve shifts to the right. Okay. And if there's no change in the supply, the equilibrium rate of interest will go up, but so will the quantity of funds. Okay, so you can see what's happened here. There's a shift to the right. There's an increased demand for loanable funds. due to economic growth. And you've, you've not, may have noticed this in the Wall Street Journal, for example. Um, ah, let me fix this. During a recovery, interest rates almost without fail will increase. The economy wakes up, the economy heats up, people want to borrow more money, et cetera. And before you know it, we do have higher interest rates. So rates do tend to rise during strong expansions and they tend to fall during recessions because then everything works in reverse. If the economy is slowing down, that's not the time to buy a new house or a new car. People will borrow less money. It's also not a good time for business to expand itself so people will, uh, businesses rather, will borrow less money. So that means that this works in reverse. Oh, decrease demand. For loanable funds, due to um, slower economic growth, let's call it. The economy is slowing down, we're all worried about it. So we stop buying, we don't cut back altogether, but we may decide maybe we'll save that new car for next year, or maybe we don't need new furniture this year, or that kind of thing. Businesses may say, you know, maybe we could start that new um, project next year. Now, if you want to see this, um, there's a great website, which I don't remember if I've shown it to you yet or not. It has all kinds of wonderful economic data. And it's run by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. The title of this database is called FRED, which stands for Federal Reserve Economic Database. And what I'm going to ask it for is U.S. interest rates. And we should be able to come up with a nice little graph. Oh boy. Um, uh, which one should we pick? Uh, I guess the prime, prime rate for banks. And we're gonna go for monthly. Ooh. Anyway, 
So these vertical bars, these gray bars represent recessions. So I'm hoping you can see um, rates can get very high from time to time. Like in the early 80s, they were very high. But then there was a recession in 1991. Actually, this is 81 and 82. And rates dropped. And actually, they kept falling for quite a while. But you can see there's a long-term downward trend. Rates are falling and falling and falling to levels that you know, realistically, you don't expect to see. In fact, why don't we switch this over to the federal funds rate, which we'll discuss later on in the course. And that's the bank, that's the rate set by the Fed. All right, let's see what they've got for us. All right, we'll give it a minute. Boy, they're going way back. Yes, you can see it's the same pattern, except that here the rates have been hovering around zero for quite a while, and they were heading a little bit back up until COVID came along, and now we're back down here. So if you look at the grand sweep of history here, we're looking at 75 years, basically, 65 years. You can see rates were climbing, and then when there was a recession, they would fall and they would start to rebound with the economy and then they would hit a recession and they start to fall and then they rise again and they fall during a recession. But now the pattern for the last 40 years has just been down, down and down. These are like levels that we may never see again ever. Um, these are very, very low rates. And so people who are dancing right now are people who bought a house because these rates of interest, I mean, God, look at, it's unbelievable how low rates are right now. Imagine if you bought a house back here, woohoo. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so interest rates do tend to go in the opposite direction of, the, uh, sorry, the same direction as the economy. They get very high when the economy is strong and they go very low when the economy is very weak. And a lot of it revolves around the demand for loanable funds. All right, what else do we have? Inflation, now everybody hates inflation. It reduces the purchasing power of the dollar so that the cost of buying goods and services rises, whereas the real or inflation adjusted return to business investment declines. Okay, so here's an important detail. Whenever you see the word real in economics, real means adjusted for inflation whereas nominal is not adjusted for inflation so you want to be careful of those terms you'll see them all over the place in economics real adjusted for inflation nominal is not adjusted for inflation so inflation means that you can actually have a raise at your job and still be able to buy less goods and services. So inflation is a problem, not, not so much here. We've had a very low rate for quite a few years now, um, but in many countries inflation is really very high. And so that definitely distorts the relationship between borrowers and lenders. In fact, Here's an interesting side note, inflation, and this is one of the reasons why it has such a strong influence on interest rates. Inflation benefits borrowers and harms lenders. So why do you suppose that is? Well, because it helps borrowers because the interest rate at which um, loans are made is fixed. 
so that as inflation erodes the purchasing power of the dollar, lenders are um, losing in real terms because borrowers are repaying their loans in cheaper dollars. Okay, so in other words, inflation is actually helping borrowers. It's hurting lenders because their rates of return are lower once you take into account the loss of purchasing power. Whereas for the borrowers, it's the other way around. Um, in terms of purchasing power, they're actually paying less back to the banks than they would have otherwise. Anyway, so what does that have to do with our loanable funds model? So therefore, Changes in inflationary expectations will affect the supply and demand for loanable funds. Now, in order to explain this, uh, yeah, this next, what we're going to do is introduce here to explain how and why this is happening. We're going to introduce the so-called Fisher effect. So this is going to take a while. I'll tell you what, since it's quarter after eight, why don't we stop for our break right here? When we get back, we'll explain the Fisher effect and how it determines the impact of inflation on uh, loanable funds. Okay. So, all right, this seems like as good a time as any to stop for our, our uh, evening break. And when we get back, we'll discuss the Fisher effect and its influence on borrowing and lending. All right. So let's knock it off for a bit and I'll see you in a little while.
All right. Here we are now. So we're going to look at the Fisher effect. So first of all, Fisher is Irving Fisher, the American economist. Let's see if we can find something about him on the internet. Yes, okay, so here's Irving Fisher. And he was a very famous economist at the turn of the 20th century. And um, he wrote some important books in which he proposed this idea of the Fisher effect. Um, he had a lot of other interesting um, things going on in his background. For example, um, he got the first ever PhD at Yale. <laughs> he taught there for a while. Um, he also invented a little item which you may have heard of. And let me show it to you on Amazon real fast. Called, and they still make these if you can believe it. The Rolodex. Yeah, remember those days? Um, that's right. This is how we used to keep track of uh, contact information on these little cards and you could spin them around with the Rolodex and find them very quickly and easily. He invented this thing. And so he made himself quite a bit of money even though he's an academic. Um, so he had sort of the best of both worlds going on. Um, an academic job with a lot of money in the bank. So um, he was a very well-known economist, and so he's most famous or most well-known today for the Fisher effect, which is a relatively simple idea. Basically, here's what he's saying. If you look at this equation, <clears throat> and this is the book's notation, every book does this a little differently. This I is the nominal rate of interest, the actually observed rate in the economy. In other words, not adjusted for inflation. Now, this is the real rate of interest. So what separates them is this component, which is called expected inflation. And the logic here is that lenders, when they decide what rate to charge you, uh, we'll think about this in two terms, the real rate, which is what they'd like to earn to compensate for the risk they're taking. And then they will add an inflation premium to that to compensate for the loss of purchasing power that they think will happen when inflation goes up. So just as a quick example, um, suppose that a bank um, is lending money for, uh, or is making mortgages to homeowners. <clears throat> the bank feels that three percent rate, real rate of return, is sufficient. Um, or is consistent with the risk that they are taking by lending out money to homeowners. Now they're not going to earn 3% in real terms unless the inflation rate is zero. If the bank expects inflation to be 2% over the coming year, or I should say in the near future, it makes sense to charge a nominal rate of interest of 5% for a mortgage of which 2% is designed to compensate or lost purchasing power. Due to inflation. All right, in other words, they're saying, listen, we think we should get a 3% real rate of return from lending out money for homes. That's consistent with the risk that we're taking. But we want to also protect ourselves from inflation because that reduces our real purchasing power.
So you know, in order to get a re real rate of return of 3%, if inflation is 2%, we have to charge 5% of which the last 2% is simply compensation, the lost purchasing power due to uh, inflation. And so if you look at uh, Fisher's equation, what you're seeing here is then in that case, we're seeing that the expected inflation rate is 2%. The uh, real rate that they wish to earn is 3%. And when you add them up, you get a chart of the rate charge of 5%. So the nominal rate will be five. Um, the real rate will be three. And then finally the expected inflation is two. And that's what Fisher's uh, relationship says, okay. So the, the, the direct connection between nominal and real is this expected inflation term. All right, so now with that being said, if in the economy as a whole, inflationary expectations rise, let's say the banking system as a whole expects inflation to go up in the future the real rate doesn't really change very frequently. So we can assume that the real rate is constant. All right, so let's say that instead of 2%, the inflation, uh, expected inflation goes up to 3%. How would the banks react to that? Okay, so in other words, the real rate stays at three but now the expected inflation goes up to three. So all of a sudden they're gonna charge their customer 6% for a mortgage because they really believe that next year the inflation rate will be even higher than it is now, rising from 2% to 3%. So therefore higher inflationary expectations. And it's not just uh, banks, you know, it could be consumers, it could be businesses, in general, higher inflationary expectations lead to higher nominal rates of interest. Okay, and, and the Fisher effect is, the, is, you know, we're using that model to explain how this is happening, but just in general, higher expected inflation, you would expect to see higher nominal rates of interest. Now, having said all of that, consumers and businesses, this is the theory, will borrow more money to maintain the real value of their borrowing. Households, on the other hand, will save less as the real rate of return to savings will decline. So in other words, they're more likely to buy things instead of save if they really believe that the returns that they're earning will be eroded by inflation. So households will consume more and save less due to higher inflation. <clears throat> I mean, really, when you think about it, why would you save if your uh, returns are going to be swallowed up by inflation? And in fact, countries that have experienced hyperinflation, nobody saves anything. They just spend their money as fast as they can before their money loses even more of its value. So what we're seeing here is that two things are changing. The demand for loanable funds will increase. while the supply decreases.
So two things are changing at once. This is something we haven't seen before. So how would that impact our supply and demand curves? All right, let's find out. So the supply curve shifted to the left. All right, people save less. On this side, uh, consumers and businesses borrow more. Now, the net effect, if you notice, the interest rate definitely goes up. The quantity depends. It depends on how far these curves shift. The quantity could go up or down or stay the same, but the interest rate will definitely go up in this case. So the nominal, I should say, in this case, the nominal rate rises. The quantity of loanable funds can increase, decrease, or remain the same. That depends on how much the curve shift, but that's not really what we're interested in anyway. What we're fo focused on primarily is the rate of interest, the nominal rate. So um, I don't know if it's possible to find a chart which shows interest rates and inflation. Uh, let's see what we can do. Yeah, I wanted it. I wanted a little graph. So now I'm not sure what this is going to be. Oh. All right. Well, this is what Fred has. Red is the inflation rate. And green is the Fed funds rate. That's the rate at which the banks borrow and lend among themselves. So it's kind of hard to see the pattern here, I think. But, you know, like the red line, it doesn't change very much. The US inflation has been very stable for quite a long time. The green line, the effective Fed's funds rate, as we saw earlier, bounces up and down quite a bit. This is the series we were looking at earlier. So when you put them together, this doesn't really illustrate very well what I was saying, that higher inflation should also ha uh, lead to higher interest rates. Uh, you know, you know. When, I guess um, that's the best we're going to do for now. No. There have been periods in history where the two of them followed each other almost perfectly. Here it's not so much. Wow. I'm kind of disappointed. Let's see what we can do. Maybe we could sneak in another um, interest rate. Or maybe if you change the dates on that chart and look further back, Professor. Oh, it, it looks, oh, let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, this series only goes back to the 70s. Yeah, see, there's the problem. They've only been keeping track of this PCE uh, deflator for uh, since the 70s. Ah, uh, well. That's all right. I mean, I'm sure we could find some better examples of this. Uh, one thing we do know, though, is that in countries that have a very high rates of inflation, the connection between the two tends to be really, really strong. Um, let's see, maybe we could find something like that. Um, Probably looking up Brazil. <laughs> okay, we'll try Brazil. Um, yeah, 
Now, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know for a fact that they have a, a little graph for us. Ah, uh, that's not what I want. Yeah, these are nice articles about Brazil, but I was hoping to get a graph. Wow. Uh, that's okay. It's right, but you get the idea. I mean, just in general, there tends to be a strong correlation between inflation and interest rates. Now, monetary policy, um, what happens here? Suppose that the economy is sluggish and the Fed decides to step in and stimulate the economy. What they're going to do is they're going to increase the supply of loanable funds. In other words, they're making funds available to the banking system to lend to their customers. Now, the, the rub there is that the bank, uh, sorry, the Fed cannot make the banks lend, but they're hoping that this will give them an incentive to lend more money. And by doing so with more funds readily available, they can lower their interest rates and actually then lend out even more money to their customers. So in general, when this happens, the supply curve for loanable funds shifts to the right because the Fed has increased loanable funds in the banking system. And the impact, which is what the Fed is after, is lower interest rates so that the economy will grow more quickly. Okay, because again, we know that consumers will buy more durable goods, they'll buy more houses, and businesses will expand their operations when rates are lower. Now, the Fed can't do this forever, of course, because eventually this will start to lead to more inflation. But in the short run, um, their job is to keep unemployment as low as possible. Um, although, of course, in the big picture sense, their number one priority is fighting inflation. They're still willing to um, risk a little bit of inflation to keep unemployment from getting too high. Now, if they engage in contractionary monetary policy, in other words, they raise rates because they're worried about inflation, the supply of loanable funds shrinks up, interest rates rise, the supply curve shifts to the left, and so we end up with higher rates and less loanable funds in the market. And of course, that accomplishes its desired objective. What they're basically doing is they're slowing down the economy to make sure that inflation doesn't get too completely out of control. Okay. Now deficits, this is a little different. Remember with deficits, the government has to pay their bills. So the more they uh, spend, the more they borrow. And it's just as simple as that. The bigger the deficits, the higher will be the demand for loanable funds. And therefore the higher will be the rate of interest. So here is the diagram illustrating what happens when the government's budget deficit gets bigger. Now, remember too, this is the federal government. We said earlier that municipal governments have some control over when they borrow. But of course they don't run up massive, massive deficits either. Okay, so the natural impact here is to see higher rates of interest. And then finally, the flow of funds from foreign countries. Uh, a lot of this depends on the relationship between interest rates in the US and in foreign countries. So for our example here, we can look at the US dollar and the Brazilian real and um, so the way they're explaining it here is that they're making a distinction between the supply and demand for loanable funds in the United States and in Brazil. Okay, so here we have dollars. You can see the subscript dollars. These are for the Brazilian currency, the real. And the supply of loanable funds is smaller in Brazil, which is why the curve is all the way over here. But you'll notice that interest rates are higher in Brazil. So therefore, um, because of the fact that they have less funds to borrow,
well, actually, I probably shouldn't have put it that way. The supply of loanable funds in Brazil is obviously smaller than in the United States. And because their deficits are very, very large compared to the size of the economy, um, the demand for loanable funds is larger. And so the impact is that Brazilian interest rates are higher than in the US. Okay, so the, the net effect of this is, it, according to this diagram, they're not that much higher, but, um, and they may not be at the, at the moment, but in the past, Brazil's interest rates could be quite a bit higher than the US. Uh, now, I guess they're a little bit closer to each other, but still they're higher in Brazil because of those two factors, uh, less funds to uh, borrow and a larger demand for those funds. Yeah, and I mean, this just reminds us too that interest rates can be very different in uh, every country throughout the world. In fact, maybe there's a chart out there somewhere for us. Oh, okay. Now, interest rates like this, 58%. That usually is a sign of a government that's in, let's say, chaos. There's a lot of turmoil in Venezuela. There's a lot of inflation. The economy is basically collapsing. Uh, but even Argentina is at 38%. That's a lot of inflation. Although not by their own historical standards. In the past, like as recently as the 80s, their inflation rate was over 2,000%. Now that's some inflation. Uh, let's see, we work our way down here. Turkey has traditionally had very high inflation rates. Uh, let's see if we can find some Western European countries. Yeah, we have to go way down here. Look at this. Wow. There's Canada, a quarter of a percent. New Zealand, a quarter of a percent. The United States. Um, oh, this is, yeah, this is actually the federal, this is the central bank's policy rate, okay? Um, because in New York, the Fed has a quarter of a percent federal funds rate, which means the banks borrow and lend among themselves at a rate of a quarter of a percent. Now. Interestingly enough, at the bottom of the chart here, did you notice there are three countries where the policy rate of their central bank is negative? Oh my God, what does that mean to have a negative rate of interest? It means if you put your money in the bank, you're going to end up with less money than you started out with. And in fact, until a few years ago, Sweden was in this group as well. So why would a country have negative interest rates? Well, they're trying very, very hard to encourage people to buy things, not save, buy, just buy everything in sight to strengthen the economy. And in fact, these countries very well might have negative inflation rates, which means that prices are actually falling. That's, that's not unusual to see. Countries with negative interest rates are likely to have uh, deflation, as it's called. That's usually, you might think that's a good thing, but in fact, deflation is actually more harmful to, to an economy, or it can be more harmful than inflation. Because what it does is it makes debts more expensive in real terms. So anyone who owes money finds themselves owing more money in real terms as, as time goes by. So um, we got close to that ourselves not too long ago. But our inflation rate now is up around 2%. And um, see, a lot of these countries, the policy rate is literally zero, which means the banks, essentially, the, the central bank is essentially giving funds to the banks to lend out. 
I'm saying, here, take it, please lend it out. But in overall, if you were to look at the same chart from let's say 20 years ago, you'd see the rates are much, much higher in the past than they are now. I mean, interest rates are quite low by historical standards across the board. It's not just the United States. Except, of course, there's always a few exceptions. Zimbabwe, 40% is nothing for them. Uh, in fact, while we're discussing Zimbabwe, let me show you a picture of something that will, you'll never forget this as long as you live. All right, I promise you, if you wanna see something that is shocking, but cool at the same time, something you'll be telling your coworkers tomorrow about, watch this. What does that say in there? How much is this note worth? $100 trillion. This was printed in 2008. At the time, it was probably enough to buy a loaf of bread because the economy was absolutely ravaged by inflation. Now, by the way, if you wanna have one of these, if you're a collector, you can have one for only $224. Look at that, 14 zeros. Wow. Anyway, so how did this come to be? Because it, uh, and there's an article in Wikipedia about this. Their hyperinflation rate reached in the fall of 2008, well, the numbers are so large that they had to put it in scientific notation. That number represents 79.6 billion percent inflation. Well, that's why we need a hundred trillion dollar bill because it's got some actual value. It might be worth a dollar and tomorrow won't be worth anything. So this is what can happen with inflation when it gets out of control. So are you, are, are you, is everyone going to have nightmares about this tonight? Yes, you are. Are you going to tell people where you work about the hundred trillion dollar bill in Zimbabwe? Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> somehow you have to make it come up in conversation somehow find a way to trick people into talking about either zimbabwe or inflation and then you can land with this one okay sometimes sometimes you can steer people in a different direction that they're talking about you get tired of them talking about the mba all the time and you say you know <laughs> all right well anyway so let's get back to this Now, Brazil also had their own period of hyperinflation. In fact, the Brazilian currency, if you notice the name is the real or real, that is meant to stand for one unit of real consumption. In 1994, they had to abandon their currency, which was called the Cruzeiro, in exchange for this real because their inflation rate was so out of control. But they also had to sort of adopt um, let's just say they had to change their policies very sharply in order to make sure the real wasn't destroyed like the Cruzeiro was. So the real was their attempt to make sure their inflation rate didn't get completely out of control. And it really stands for one real unit of consumption. So the idea was that it was going to maintain its value and they've done a pretty good job with it. Um, infl Brazil's inflation since that time has been quite stable as a matter of fact. Let's see what we can find about that. Uh, 
Okay, so in 1988, it looks like, 80, 1990, they were up around 3,000%. Okay, so the introduction of the real takes place right about here. 94, that's right. And look what happened to it since then. Look at those numbers. There's nothing in there but threes and sixes and fives. Wow, so sometimes this helps. Now, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, if the central bank keeps printing money, the government keeps spending like crazy, having a new currency doesn't do the slightest bit of good. So Brazil had to not only introduce a new currency, but they had to adopt some new policies whereby they just tightened up their spending and their borrowing. And the result speaks for itself. Look how low inflation has been ever since. Pretty impressive. Man. That's interesting. <laughs> um, so you can probably do the same thing with Zimbabwe. Oh, maybe not. I, I guess we got lucky with that one. But anyway, so you get the idea. So anyway, so now those are the factors that influence uh, interest rates through their effect on the supply and demand of loanable funds. So that was kind of it for chapter two. So we have a little time left, not much. What I'd like to do is take a peek at chapter three which is kind of an extension of what we're doing here because it also involves interest rates. In fact, before we do that, why don't I show you, I may have done this already. Um, we're gonna to go to the treasury market here for a minute and take a look at what kind of returns we could earn right now. And you can see that these are all treasury securities and unlike many other bond issuers, these bonds are available with maturities from one month all the way up to 30 years, all right? Typically corporate bonds have a maturity of 30 years and that's all you have to choose from. These got, they're different. They have all these available maturities, but the interest rates up to, a, let's say maybe here are under 1%. They're low. They're very low. The reason why they're so low is because everybody has confidence that they will make the interest payments that they promise people. So this relationship between the maturities of these securities and their yields, as they're called, is known as, and let me write this down here for you somewhere, the term structure of interest rates, the relationship between the maturities of treasury securities and their yields or interest rates. So we call it the term structure of interest rates. <clears throat> now, here's a good question. Why does it look like this? If you notice, the rates are really low and then all of a sudden they start rising fairly quickly before they reach a peak of 2.21. So if I were to draw a plot of that, And here I've got the maturity. It's gonna look, it's gonna be flat and it'll start to rise, something like that. And this graph, by the way, is often called the yield curve. And throughout history, yield curves have had many different shapes, but in general, the most normal shape that we traditionally have seen with these yield curves is more or less just upward sloping.
In other words, if you look at the entire history of the U.S., this is the majority of the time, this is what the yield curve has looked like, more pretty much upward sloping. And so the question is why? Why is this happening? Why do you get such a low return from one month of treasury bills and such a nice return from 30-year 30, 30 treasury bonds? What's going on there? That's an interesting question. Now, if you want to look, by the way, I mean, you know, we all know that interest rates are unusually low levels right now. Why don't we take a peek just to, for the fun of it? Let's see what they look like in, let's say, 2006. Oh, my God, look how high those numbers are. They're all well above 4%. Well, um, but of course, no disasters were taking place in 2006. It was a more normal time. Or let's try 1999. Whoa, they're even higher. Look how high these numbers are. In those days, you could have gotten 5.15% from a 30-year treasury bond. Man. And the inflation rate really wasn't much higher than it is now. So something strange is going on here. These curves depend on what's going on in the economy. Um, when things are going tough though, a recession like 1991, then they start, oh, now look at that. Look how high they are. But that's because inflation was higher than it is now. All right, so um, that's part of the reason, but look at these numbers. Even a three-month treasury bill is paying 6.66%. What are we getting now, 0.01%? So what we would like to do is develop a theory which helps us understand why the interest rates behave the way they do. This is all coming from the market. Um, the Fed can influence this up to a point, but ultimately these are free market prices. Okay. Um, this is coming from the interaction between borrowers and lenders. So what's going on? Why are interest rates looking this way? That's what we want to talk about in chapter three. Um, all right, let me go get it open real fast. So the actual title of this chapter is the structure of interest rates. It, it's, it's being used in a more general sense than just the term structure, because that really only focuses on the maturity structure. There's other structures that we can assign to interest rates. Now, we know that there's many different kinds of securities that trade in the marketplace. Treasury securities, when you buy a treasury from the government, you're lending them money. And in exchange for that, you're earning interest. But you could do the same thing with corporate bonds too. So why would you think about buying an Apple bond, 30-year Apple bond, instead of a 30-year treasury bond? What might be the main difference between the two? Well, probably the Apple bond will pay a higher rate of interest. But why? Why can Apple pay you more interest than the government? What is different between the two? Well, in a nutshell, the difference between Apple bonds and the federal uh, treasury bonds is risk. Even though it seems hard to believe, Apple in principle could go out of business if everything goes wrong. Can that happen to the federal government? No, they can't go out of business. And if they run out of money, they can raise taxes. So treasury securities are considered to be risk-free while all other bonds in the marketplace have at least some credit risk. 
no matter how sliver, uh, how trivial, there's always some slim possibility that any corporation could disappear. It happens. All right. So one of the factors that determines this relationship between interest rates is in fact risk. What else might there be? Okay, how about maturity? Now we saw with the treasury market that the maturity, the rates are being, that are being paid are very low. If you're buying a very short maturity bond, let's say you buy a one month treasury bill, you're getting 1.01%. But that 30 year bond is paying 2.3%. Uh, now, there's a reason for this, but we don't have time to get it into it tonight. Why is the 30-year bond paying so much more than the one-month bond? I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with risk. Not credit risk, but another kind of risk, which we'll explain next time. Okay, it's a little late tonight for that kind of thing, but um, liquidity. Remember, liquidity is the ability to convert an asset into cash or basically you trade it for goods and services. Treasuries are the most liquid bonds in the economy. Corporate bonds may not be quite as liquid. It may take time to sell a corporate bond. You may have to suffer a loss to do it. So treasuries have another advantage over other bonds in the economy, and that is liquidity. I can sell a treasury security at a moment's notice with no trouble. Can I do that with a low rated corporate bond? Probably not. And one more is taxes. Treasuries provide tax breaks that you do not get with other types of bonds. All right, so that's another reason why treasuries are so popular. You can get tax breaks by buying them. So all of these factors combine to give us a multitude of interest rates on all these different bonds out there because they all have different levels of liquidity, they have different maturities, they have different levels of risk, and they have different tax treatments. So there's a whole slew of different interest rates out there, not just the treasury market. So we wanna understand how these markets are related to each other and the factors that determine the structure of interest rates. All right, well, anyway, but we can save this for next time. And uh, we're gonna delve more deeply into this topic of interest rates. And of course, we're not gonna stay in this forever. Uh, we'll go on to something else as well, but for now, we're gonna stick with interest rates for a little bit longer because it's such an important topic. All right, so in the meantime, I guess, um, let's, I guess we'll, we've had enough fun for one night. We'll stop right here. And then next time we'll pick it up where we left off. All right. Okay. So I'll see you all next time. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Right. Welcome. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Bye. See you next week. See you later.